Come on, Lola, no, no. Lola. Let's go, no, no. Come on, let's go, no, no. Are you gonna stay out there for the whole show? <coughs> oh my gosh, I might need water shit. Ugh. of hosting a live show the live show <laughs> oh my gosh i i seriously had everything that was on off mute i was getting ready i said you know what these people want to see something glamorous and then i had to i had to pee i had to pee i had to pee like a, a normal person has to do and i'm very very excited it's great that um you know there's opportunities in all moments of life, even live moments where you have to use the bathroom like a normal person. Hi, everybody. I'm your host, Carnita Sada, and welcome. Welcome to We Vibe, You Thrive. This is our fifth episode. We are so, so excited. Today's episode, we have Hugh Johnson all the way from California. Hugh Johnson has an amazing, amazing story. We're going to get to hear about that, and we're going to get to share a lot of different things. The purpose of the show is to kind of connect through conversation and also while you're watching, if you see anything that you have a question on or anything that you want further explanation on, please type in, we're here. We can pop it up on the screen and we can share those questions because where you get involved, we get involved and we get to kind of get into a deeper meaning and deeper understanding on certain conversations. So welcome. Are you all ready to start this amazing show? Ah! Virtual applause, virtual applause, virtual applause, yes. So you know me in a bio, I like to give a good bio of somebody because this is kind of like a little backstory on who they are, a little understanding on what they stand for, how they're working in their daily lives. And I also want to see how California is doing with some of the Corona stuff. But on today's episode, we have Hugh Johnson and Hugh Johnson says this about them. Hugh Johnson is a disabled queer artist and a gardener who found queer community and gender validation through drag. He, stayed, he started at, at a very young age, but made his mark by producing a big drag show and dinner called Crab and Drag every year for his birthday. Soon, he was booked on stages near and far and won the title of King of the Redwoods. A week after performing at the Austin International Drag Festival, he was hit head on by a reckless driver. It was a miracle he lived, but this, but his bones were crushed from head to toe. He spent five months in the hospital, has 12 plates holding him together, had 15 surgeries, and now just needs a few more. It has been very devastating for this uh, individual who is already a disabled artist, especially being um, imp immunopress uh, compromised, as well as uh, receiving tra trauma from this pandemic and this kind of accident. So we get to hear from um, this amazing artist in just a moment. 
So I want to ask you guys, we have a few more episodes, and um, I just wanted to ask you, um, are you ready for a season two? Are you ready for a season season two? Uh, we have we have some other other things planned, so we are thinking maybe a couple more episodes. Seven seems about right. Hopefully, fingers crossed, our good sister, Calypso Jete, um, also from California, who's on the new legendary HBO um, series about ballroom. Um, we're going to hear from them, them see, see how they're doing, check in with this amazing new reality show that they have been uh, inspiring to be. And then if, if everything goes right next week, we'll have Johnny Rios. And Johnny Rios is a barista among baristas. Johnny is a coffee connoisseur and can maybe teach us something about beans or how to make it art or how to ensure that when we drink coffee or we're drinking alcohol beverages or even non-alcohol beverages and we're able to have fun with those kind of drinks. So as you notice, Hayes isn't here today and that's fine. Hayes um, decided that they wanted to sit the day out. You know, we're roommates, we're enjoying each other's company, but it's also good to get away, you know, just a little bit, just a little scotch. Um, so I wanna show you something. So our guest, our guest today um, is, is dialing in. I'm not quite sure what happened to their feed, but they are dialing in. Uh, and I wanna show you something. It is so important that you see this because on December 8th, I believe, December 8th or 18th, it was um, a, a really bad day when this individual um, went, went on a drive, just like any other drive after leaving the, I think it's after leaving the Austin International Drag Fest. And I'm not sure if you can hear me, um, but I wanna show you a picture. This individual was in this car accident and this is, this is what it looked like. This is the honest to God truth, and this is not altered. This is just something that we have to understand that this is literally a miracle that this individual is still here with us. So take a look. So this is going to be, um, this is going to be the car accident. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna close my, And it was, I, I'm not sure if you were able to hear me during that, uh, putting up that picture, but that individual was in this car, this car accident. And this car accident was devastating. And like they said, they had 15 surgeries and all these different things. And it, it was interesting because one of my friends who was going to be on the show earlier, um, Max Ryder from the Uni uh, UK, indicated that... <clears throat> Hugh Johnson should be on the show. And I was like, okay, great. Let's, let's, let's hear from him. Let's see what the story is. And I didn't know that those two were in the same car together. And Max Ryder had visited, uh, visited from the UK winning uh, like some uh, King competition and was able to do some of these really cool events. And that's how I met them. But um, Hugh Johnson was also, I believe was driving the car. So um, I, it's gonna be great that we get to hear from them um, in just a moment. There is, there's something great to be said when you have a live, <laughs> a live feed and you're just trying to ensure that you can reach everybody from all across the world, no matter where they're at in life, no matter what's happening. It is, um, it's great to just be able to speak with people and to engage with people and to do it in a manner that we have not done it before, which is digitally. Ooh. Um, so I kind of want to give you guys uh, some of my Corona update, uh, some COVID stuff. Uh, I am in the medical field. I love the medical field. I think it's great. I, uh, I think there are great warriors in the medical field, not necessarily me specifically, but I get to work with some people that are going into some of these places where everybody has COVID-19 and that's all you know, and you have to gown up and um, put on all this equipment. So those are the real heroes. Um, so kind of to give you an update, we uh, I did a test a few weeks ago. I was negative for like all the antibodies and stuff, so I haven't been exposed. But for, for those living in Arizona, we're starting to open up things. We're starting to open things up. And I noticed that um, 
nobody's social distancing or wearing masks. And I, I, and it's, I get it like, you know, people want to have their choice and I get it that people are just trying to, um, you know, live their life. But the whole mask situation is, is to protect those that can't really wear them or to ensure that, you know, I may not be presenting symptoms, but we know how sick you might get or how you might be or where you might be in, in the coronavirus scheme of things. Um, so if you're walking out in public, please wear a mask or use an app, have someone go out in public for you. Right now, we, we are seeing crowds in places of, of hundreds and hundreds of people. Like our casinos are open and I love a good casino. Like, let me tell you what, I love a good casino. I just get really, really nervous um, when you have so many people uh, in just one area, just trying to manipulate around each other. And you're gonna bump into people, you're gonna talk to people, you're gonna engage with people, you're gonna touch things that other people have touched. And um, it's, it's hard to watch because we don't have like a black light or something we can indicate, oh yeah, the virus is on that. Um, and I just, I, want, I just want everyone to be safe. I just want everyone just to be able to wash their hands and be able to go through their life and not feel like they're gonna get sick from somebody else's, can I say ignorance? Ignorance isn't, ignorance isn't, is, isn't a thing. Um, it's lack of empathy towards your other neighbors, towards your community members, to the people that live around you because it's, it's a collective effort. It's a collective effort, y'all. A collective effort. What does that mean? What does a collective effort mean? It means this and only this. It means that in order to get over what we are going through and not even over barely, I'm just saying like even to tolerate what's happening, it has to be collective effort where you're doing what the same thing I'm doing. We're all on the same page because when one person decides not to do it, then 10 other people have to pick up the slack for them. And I don't know about you, but my back hurts. And I sweat very easily. And if I'm carrying around 10 other people, mama's not gonna be happy. Mama's not gonna be happy at all. Especially, especially since I just got moved into this new apartment. And I know you're like, oh, Carnita, why are you really making? This is sometimes how I feel. Sometimes I don't feel like we're making. Sometimes I feel like fluid. Sometimes I feel like a, a rainbow chachia pad. Sometimes I just feel that way. I um I want to I want to just double check on our, on our guests and see what's happening with them because I'm not quite sure what happened to them. I hope they're okay. They were just on. Um, but meanwhile, I'm going to answer some calls uh, some calls, some questions from anybody that would like to answer them. And I have never answered these questions before. It's because, um, I, well, maybe I've answered a couple of these. It's because moments like this, if we need to uh, wait for our guests, which on a live show, you have to do it. And I am very, very capable of stalling. And in fact, in fact, a good show host, and I'll tell you this, I'll tell all the baby queens, I'll tell all the people that um, ever wanna be a host, a good show host is a good staller. A staller. You don't have to be funny. You don't have to be witty. You don't have to be shady. You don't have to be talented. All you have to do is be a good staller. And I'm gonna be a good staller. I'm gonna teach you some, some stalling one-on-one. Stalling one-on-one. We're going to ask, um, I, I want you in the comments, I want you to pick a number one through 10. And I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna answer this question, but since I have to answer the question when Hugh Johnson comes on, if they come on, we'll see, we have 45 minutes. Uh, we are going to, um, we are going to have them answer the questions the way that you guys picked them instead of how they want to pick the questions. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. Look at that, look at, look at that twist, the plot twist. Um, some things that are happening here in Arizona, I don't know if you all have been watching or been paying attention, but we are moving towards the 100 degree weather. 100 plus, 100 plus. It's not hot, I like it, it's great. This outside would be a mess, would be a mess. And I had just shaved my head, by the way, those that donated, for that little shaving incident. Thank you so much. One in 10 is very appreciative about it. But, um, so pick a number, 
Chi Chi, anybody pick a number? Otherwise, I'm gonna pick a number and you don't want me to pick a number because I always start with number one. Okay, number one it is. Ladies and gentlemen, we have done this before, but this is the Choose Your Own Adventure, Building My Dream or Quest for Closure. Today we have, uh, I'm gonna choose Building My Dream, which is the adventure that I would like to do. Um, if I could build anything, or excuse me, if I could build something that I've always wanted to do in my life, can I describe that? And what would that look like if I achieved that? Oh, crap. Should I do drag related or personal related or community related? Um, professionally, I, I would say if I could build my own dream, I would, I would be a lobbyist. I would love to be a lobbyist. I, um, that way I could lobby for organizations that I believed in, also organizations that could pay me to ensure that my voice is being accounted for, for what they need it for, whatever, if it's uh, advocating for a low income rent or uh, making sure that social justice is being done in our prisons because they're being overpopulated and individuals can't get out and we have a high rate of COVID-19. Stuff like that. Being a lobbyist is 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 part political, but it's also part activism. It is. It is. It is very much activism. You know, obviously they have some lobbyists like the the medical insurance companies and and these big conglomerates that don't want certain bills passed because it might cost them money. That's not the lobbyist I'm talking about. I'm talking about an actual lobbyist, like. Um, an association that hires you to just put in opinions on certain bills and be pro or against them just to make sure that these lawmakers aren't making laws and people aren't, uh, people aren't standing up for them. It's when you don't stand up for them and when you don't have the voice and you don't get active, like even calling your state senator or your local senator or your federal senator, like, your local senator is your state senator, by the way. Um, your federal senators, they listen. And they and they listen when you email and call in groups. And I'm talking like groups. When everybody is mad or upset or wants something changed, if you call in groups, you can't be ignored, I promise you. There's only so many spots on the, um, <laughs> so many spots on the answer machine. It's true, it's true. So many spots on the answer machine. Well, that was awesome. I want to uh, ask uh, if, if you guys have one more number that I can choose from, it's okay. We may have to end this early. I'm gonna I'm gonna physically call and see where this uh, individual's at while you guys decide the number. We're live. You just keep you just keep calling and keep talking. So also something that I did this weekend is I I went to Payson yesterday. I had a very, 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 very lovely evening. We camped, I believe it was on the rim. Is that in Payson? Yeah, it was in Payson. And I watched the sunrise and sunset and had a, um, okay, Allison number eight, and had just a really good time um, enjoying nature. How many people get out in nature uh, as a reset, as, as a Capricorn or somebody, that really thrives through earth connection. That's more, that's my, that's my go-to when I'm, when I have a lot of stuff going on up here and, and I have, I'm pulled a million different ways. The way I get out of it is remembering my, my grounding, my foundation, just like a tree has to be rooted. Nature is kind of my thing. Um, and last night I was able to do that med meditate this morning. I, I know it's kind of sound of kind mm, uh, meditate, but it's, Meditation helps get you out of here. All right, Allison, just for you. We're gonna do two more questions, which is fine. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, and you guys get to learn some cool things about me, and I'm all about that. I've done this with my sister, Pump Up The Jam, but I'm gonna tell you something. I've been listening to a new song-ish, a new-ish song, a new song for me. I don't know if it's new, and I've been really, I've been really jamming to it, and that song is this. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. I don't know if it's something that would ever reach your playlist. I don't know if you would ever look it up, but it is called When We're High. When We're High. Here, I'll, I'll put it in the comments. When We're High by LP. Look it up. It's a good song. 
it's kind of chill. It's more low key. It has a, a lot of undertones of kind of like creepy almost, which is my style sometimes. Just to be a little creepy, a little bit creepy. Um, I would I would love to get creepy with all of you if you'd like. Um, so two more things that I'm doing coming up is we're gonna film a going to try to film a, a sexual assault series. And the sexual assault series uh, is something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, myself included have experienced uh, sexual trauma from you know a young age to being um, my roommates. My roommates when I lived here like took advantage of me. And it is a hard thing to admit. It's also even harder to relive. And the people that have watched this and are going to watch this are um, are going to share their stories, and they're going to share them honestly. And they might get dark, they might get twisted, but they're their stories. And the reason why they're sharing them is to heal. The, re the reason why they're sharing them is to show resilience. The reason why they want to give back in that way is to ensure that they um, they are seen and that they they're they're never forgotten for the things that the people are are doing to them um, or had done to them. Oh, hang on, he was calling. Oh, I oh my gosh, are we gonna answer this live? Oh gosh, I don't know if this is gonna work, Hugh. I don't know if this is gonna work, Hugh. It's okay, click on the link, my dear. We'll we'll make it work. I'm, I'm gonna finish answering this. So the sexual assault series is hopefully gonna be in partnership with some other organization. That way uh, we can bring up-to-date information regarding our LGBT community and how affected uh, affected we are on a daily basis, especially our trans brothers and sisters and, and the, our, our individuals of color who feel like they um, that they aren't seen because no one's gonna take their story seriously if they tell them or a power and control move when someone has money or someone has wealth and they um, they use that for people uh, to hold leverage over people. And uh, hopefully we'll hear some of those uh, stories so that we can really just heal as a community and we can fight through whatever we're fighting through. Maybe, maybe just maybe someone's gonna see that and they're gonna, they're gonna be able to make an effective change in their own, their own space. I find I find that there's um, there's truth in, in in telling everybody what you've been through. As hard as it is, it, it actually is very freeing most of the time. And also, it, it, it gives a moment to take the power back. Um, you know, so frequently people uh, cross our energy paths and they, they take advantage of us and they take a piece of us, but we forget how big of a light we are and how bright we shine and the many other great attributes that we have that's, that aren't just, you know, that aren't just a physical thing, but it's a, a mind, body, and spiritual thing. Um, something that I've been working on, and, and maybe this is something that we can talk about, is having a, having a foundation that just is centered around self-love. Self-love! Like, I know it's so taboo. I know it sounds so cliche, and I know it sounds so ridiculous, but self-love is the hardest love. I know RuPaul says it, but what? how do you achieve self-love? How do you go about your day making sure that you love yourself, even in those moments when you walk past the mirror, and you walk past that mirror really fast because you don't want to look what's in the mirror. You don't want to look at who's in the mirror. And see, the self-love that I'm talking about is being able to appreciate the flaws that you dislike or to be able to appreciate the character shortcomings or to be able to appreciate the trauma through because you got to this stage in life and you got to this stage in life for a reason. And you're here watching this and listening to this and engaging with this because something drew you to this space. So I wanna thank you so much for tuning in. Um, if you start a watch party, if you at all share this, I will be greatly, greatly appreciated. Um, we have a couple more Sundays. And like I said, we're gonna revamp and we're gonna make sure that we may have an, an we may have a we may have an intro video, an actual intro video. My sister's making new cards for me. Um, my sister is a, a, a hero and a champion. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have been blessed to have Hugh Johnson is here! Thank you.
you. You thank made you, it. Thank you. Oh, wow. Where have I been all this time? <laughs> you made it. I was teaching everybody how to be a good host. Oh, wow. What's your secret? Uh, there's no secret. <laughs> it's it's just being able to stall and stall well. And yeah. and luckily, luckily, I always have a lot to talk about. So it works out in my favor. You know, so you I want everyone to give Hugh Johnson a, a round of applause. Hugh Johnson, thank you so much for joining us. You're calling in from California. Is that correct? Yes, I am on the California coast. Um, I was on the beach before I came in for the, the live chat. And so the... I can hear the ocean from my room here. It's pretty amazing. There's bioluminescent bacteria. So at night, the waves crash and are like a blinding blue electric color. It's oh, wow. magical. Phenomenal. Do you get to go out there every night? And is that your self care kind of moment watching the waves crash? It's one of them. Yes. I do really, really appreciate the waves crashing waves yeah we were talking before while we we're waiting uh for you to dial in is we we're talking about self-care kind of stuff and what really gets us to a place where we can you know be at peace where we can accept our flaws where we can just you know take the day without being so hard on ourselves how do you manage your self-care that's very important yeah um it's hard to take care of ourselves you know we take care of so many other people and then, you know, we don't feed ourselves the food we should eat and we don't exercise like we should eat the exercise. And, you know, it's like we, we need to pretend we're like, our, we're taking care of our inner child and yeah. what we would give our children, we would give to us, our future generations of us. And our bodies are so precious, our, our physical, bodies are precious so I've been through so much that I have no choice but to take care of myself with my diet and exercise and positive thinking um it's a lot we are very very uh, self uh, self-abusive um with oh, our yeah. current culture this culture is so self-abusive um, and it makes it okay with distractions, you know, media. Um, so it's, it's, it's difficult to take care of ourselves. It's a full-time job, really. I mean, yeah. I am not easy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what? I, why not? Well, I'm just, I'm just joking around a little bit, but I, I mean, I am, um, I don't cheat on myself. So that makes it easy. I don't, you know, like, Oh, I'll just eat this today. And then tomorrow I'll go back on my diet. I, I can't do that. I'll end up in the hospital. So I stay safe and I stay safer now with the pandemic. I've always been a germaphobe, but now I can just take the extra precaution and not everybody thinks I'm so weird. I'm, just, I'm kind of fitting in now. Um, but it's still hard um, to look out for yourself in a world that's not into self-care. You know, it's not taught to us as children and it's not given to us in our economy. You know, we don't get paid to stay home when you're sick and we darn should. <laughs> and well, I, we I, I want to, I, I want to kind of, um, I, I want to go back to your bio because, uh, your bio is very, very important to me. By the way, because I skip around a lot, I want to say happy International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia, and Biphobia. Yay. Oh, happiness. Yeah. I didn't know that was today. It's on Yay. the 16th. Is today the 16th? That was yesterday. Oh. I'm sorry. I'm a day behind. I hope, and, but, I hope but, you things know, just continue to get better. And I, there's still a lot, lot, of, lot of work to do. Interna internationally, uh, we should still try to emit our light and not try to um, hide at all anymore. Um, as someone who's visible in your own community, how how do you how do you stay like active in 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 this kind of time? Like, how do you well, stay present? I have this obsession. Um, 
I have a calling and p- passion in life. Uh, besides, mm-hmm. you know, just having great hair, uh, I am addicted to building soil. I love Ooh. composting. And so uh, when I got down here after the accident, um, Actually, even when I was in the hospital for five months, some of my students brought me a worm bin and I started feeding worms and then I planted a tree on the hospital grounds. And then the other hospital I went to, I planted a little garden there. And now that I've been here in Southern California, staying with family, recovering, um, I started a garden here on the balcony. And then I just kept getting more things to put soil in like Rubbermaid bins and I do all sorts of earth sciences. So not only am I just filling a bin with soil, I'm building structure and I'm building compostable water and nutrient holding capacity chemistry with the ingredients I'm using. Um, so I'm building like permaculture use bins in an urban setting. And so I've been uh one of the neighbors asked if there was anything they could do to help me. And I said, can I grow a garden in your front yard? And he said, absolutely. So I've got uh, probably about 12 bins over there now, just, you know, big rubber made totes, wow. you know, and drilled holes in them, filled them with straw, chip, manures and soil. Um, and so I got a garden there now, the balcony, and then there's another little garden out in front of the driveway, a couple rubber Rubbermaid bins there that my brother's growing microgreens in. So we're able to eat microgreens every day. And What's a microgreen? Microgreens is, you know, all the salads and kales and all the greens you can eat? Yeah. Okay, well, when you, they're babies... When they just sprout and after like about three or four weeks, they're like only this tall. And the greens are small. You know, kale leaf is this beautiful flowery, fluttery leaf. But when it's small, it's so... what's that? I'm, I'm, I'm a fluttery leaf. Yes, kale, yes. Kale, yeah. Mm. Kale, yeah. Kale, yeah. So, kale, yeah. Kale, yeah. <laughs> Kalia, can I get a collard? Hey, green, collard green. Kalia, I, I have a question for you. Yeah. So this sounds more than just a passion. Is this something that you studied, or like you sound very, uh, very yeah. like it's like it, it's a career or something? Um, I I do get paid uh to do workshops and teach people how to make compost and garden and permaculture. So I, I do have quite a uh, talent there, but it, it has been difficult being disabled and doing, uh, doing work in general. Yeah, but I try it's that's why it's more like a passion and a calling. And so yeah, I did go, you know, I got my natural sciences degree at Humboldt State University. And I also got um, environmental sciences, natural resources, interpretation and planning. So interpreting natural resources and sciences to people in a language that is relatable and understandable and to also have a connection to the experience. So having, say, a connection to a natural resource, going out to the redwoods and looking at those tall trees with your neck up and having an experience so that you will change your behavior and not litter or want to save the redwoods, you know, like actually have an experience to nature to call you to want to do something. And that's what happened to me. And I want to make compost to heal the earth. So I'm on a healing journey. I've been healing Since I was 17, I got Crohn's disease, had half my intestines removed, and now I've been in the accident. And so I'm just on a healing journey and compost. We're going to talk about the accident. We're going to talk about uh, your identity as being a disabled artist. We're going to talk about 
how how you're managing as a drag artist. But the most important question that comes in from Sydney. Sydney says, "What is the best way to do a compost?" <laughs> uh, the best way is with paper, paper and carbon, like cardboard. Is so uh, all your food waste is. Um, you know, prime for composting. And so most people get started because you have a lot of food waste coming out of your kitchen. But the best way to make compost is take that food waste and mix it with paper. Wow. Paper bags, shredded newspaper, shredded no paper, shredded office paper, napkins, paper ads? towels. What about those ads you get in the, in the, in the, um, oh, in the mail, in the mail. Like, you know, the, oh. like those ads at the grocery store? No, most ads are like shiny. They have that shiny residue on them. And uh, I don't do a lot of colored shiny paper. It has heavy metals in it. So it's not the best for compost. And I get a little picky with my compost. So, but toilet paper rolls and egg cartons are super good for compost because not only are they a source of carbon, but they're a source of air. Oxygen is the most important thing in all compost piles is you wanna have oxygen. So carbon adds structure, it adds oxygen, it adds energy, and it adds uh, moisture absorption. Mm. So it really helps keep a compost healthy. It absorbs odor. Uh, it filters odors, it absorbs moisture, so it keeps it from going anaerobic and stinky and making gases. We vibe, you thrive. Uh, so you want to build your populations of the microbiotic kingdom. So you want diversity, diversity of carbons, diversity of nitrogens. Nitrogens are your food wastes. And when you put food waste plus paper waste, which is basically a nitrogen plus a carbon, in science, that makes Earth. Those two periodic table elements, there it's such a amazing, beautiful process to just put a a salad of torn paper and a salad of all the leftovers from from making a salad. <laughs> and it turns into this black, beautiful chocolate earth that is plant nutrient available and it's fertile. And yeah, that's, that's what I'm into is fertilizing the planet. I'm big. I've got a lot of fertile feed. So if you need to get fertile, you let me know. You, you go to you. You're the man. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You. I will, I, I'll get the earth pregnant. You, you do it. You, you lay all the eggs in those. Uh, chocolate soil. I've never heard soil called chocolate before, but somehow I like, I thought, oh, wow, that's a good soil. It's a chocolate soil. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question for you. I know that you just geeked okay. out and nerded out on soil, and I love that. I love that. I love that. Um, it's actually something I, I have been wanting to learn, and I, um, I'm i really bad at, at growing, growing plants. Even cactus uh, plants, I have... Um, I've overwatered a cactus. I've drowned a cactus before. That's okay. Just keep trying. Keep trying. The plants keep have trying. souls. How many? How many plants do I have to kill before I stop? <laughs> Just keep trying. Just keep trying. Um, it, what, plants die too, and then you know what? That's how you make compost. Is uh, with the dead plants. Yeah, All yeah. organic matter matters. All so matter recycle matters. it. All, all those matter, nutrients matter. <laughs> will go back into the soil. Go take all those nutrients and recycle them back into the soil. Quick, Hugh, what is a good way that someone can contact you? What's a good email? Um, I'm Hugh Johnson at face on Facebook. Yeah, find them. Absolutely, hook them up. They want to. They want to know more about plants. And I said, get, reach out to you. Awesome. So, yeah, I I'll talk about plants. So I know we talked about your your babies and your passion project of plants and soil and all the all great things microbiology, but you in your bio had listed yourself as a disabled queer artist. Can you kind of yeah. elaborate on that a little bit more? What's uh, yeah, I can. I so when I was seventeen, I didn't 
quite know I was queer yet, but um, I definitely was looking back. I was uh, playing soccer and I tore all the ligaments in my left knee to ACL, MCL, meniscus, terrible triad. And my left, so my left knee had to be reconstructed. And because it was so messed up inside, they couldn't take any of my own tissues and repair it. So they used a donor ligament from a cadaver. And after the surgery, uh, my leg didn't heal very well. And I also developed a very severe disease called Crohn's disease. Mm -hmm. It's an autoimmune of the digestive tract. And it took several years to figure out what was going on. And, you know, I was so skinny. I'd lost so much weight. I could barely keep any clothes on. I was so tired. I'd black out going up a flight of stairs. I could barely go to school. I was just starting college. And so we found out it was Crohn's disease. And I kept trying to go through life. Um, but eventually I... You know, I was hospitalized a lot. Uh, Definitely have come very close to crossing over a few times with the disease, but I've been hospitalized several times. That saved me about once a year. And then I had my, I had half of my intestines removed. It was a cantaloupe-sized mass of scar tissue in my right side of my colon and my small bowel. And so they cut all of that out, hooked me back up together and sewed me up. So I actually have a scar up the front of my body um, that you can't see. And I do a lot, I do burlesque drag and you can't tell because of how I do my makeup. And so it looks like abs, but drag gave me the confidence to actually go out and not wear a shirt and it sucks not being able to wear a shirt with when you have tits so when i found drag i could be topless and walk around and feel sexy and i mean i never ever wore a two-piece bathing suit ever never showed my stomach off but drag definitely gave me the confidence because i could put makeup on my body and you know, make my, make my butt look good too. You know, I definitely put makeup on my butt, my legs. I did full body contouring. Full body. Yeah. Full body contouring. Wow. How long does that take? Uh, it takes a long time. I'm definitely working until they call my name. (laughs) I'm, I'm back behind the stage, just like looking at my ass in the mirror and If I have time, if I have time, I blush my buns. Yeah. I blush my, I blush my pecs, my abs and my buns. I love that idea. Well, so you went through this Crohn's journey. You had this surgery. It changed your life. You changed your eating habits. You um, have done drag for how many years, would you say? Well, um, I started when I was young. Like in grade school, I would dress up with my friends and then take pictures. Um, And I would always dress up in my dad's clothes and take my mom's eyebrow pencil and draw on a beard. Um, But I didn't come out to my community until 2015. I had, actually it was three years before that, I had a birthday party and the theme was crab and drag. So it was... 2011, um, we went kayaking, caught crabs, and then invited all our friends over to the house, and we ate crab in drag, and it caught on. So for three years, I did it at my friend's house, and then I went big and did it at a local grange and made it a nonprofit fundraiser for two nonprofits, uh, a pride for, for the pride um, parade and for saving the redwoods. So redwoods and rainbows was my little theme. Um, that's why I wore the rainbows. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, we, so yeah, we ate 
crab and dressed in drag and we had a big show and it was my first time performing for the public i had been performing for my friends you know at the birthday party but it was my first time performing publicly um and that's on my youtube channel i'm austin powers international man of compost mystery mystery <laughs> and uh i have a scene on stage i do a performance as austin fighting dr evil and his evil gmos the genetically modified orgasms crime against humanity what a, really what a crime yeah i'm, I'm surprised you didn't you didn't bust out a, a handful of chocolate soil and eat it mm. Mm. I'll see plants like chocolate too. And that's why I call it chocolate. Cause it's like the plants just, Oh, they love worm castings. That's don't, like they, don't, they like, don't they like coffee too. Don't plants like coffee. I heard they like coffee ground. My, my compost loves coffee. So yeah. Yeah. I, I have roommates here that drink coffee. So I go every day and I get their coffee and I feed my worms. I'm feeding the worms, the coffee first, and then the plants, the plants will get it. So, yeah. There's nothing. Yeah, there's nothing like having a thick worm around if you when you need it to really give your plant what you need. The worms make everything better. I really just want a global worming, a big just worming, yeah, just yeah, like a red, big red wiggler mm -hmm. is part of my um uh. A uh, montage uh, the uh, adventures of the big red wiggler and I actually um, have a compost workshop where I teach everybody about worm composting composting with worms and it happens to be on May Day the day of fertility Beltane and so I teach them about worms and how to make a worm bin and you know, what they eat and what they like. And then the whole workshop though, is about how do worms make the best fertilizer possible? They not only fertilize the earth, but they fertilize each other because they're hermaphrodites. They have male and female organs. So they, have an, a beautiful mating dance that they do. And I have everyone in the workshop reenact that mating dance. And they're, they're definitely, you know, they're shown a video and we use props. So they learn, they know exactly how to do it and they get to try it. Um, I'm going to bring it into my next show. I'm going to do the, uh, the worm dance mating um, game. <laughs> and whoever does the worm sexual mating dance the best will receive um, nothing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we don't okay. have prizes. So this is a low budget season one. Come on. You know, you just, you just win fertility. That's what you, you win. Your just, eggs get fertile. You get a clit and everybody gets a clitellum. You could take your clitellum home and use that every single time. And it's, it's really all about the clitellum. The worms have an organ called a clitellum. And in the workshop, I call it clit for short. So Why not? we we work on, you know, stimulating the clit and making sure it's um, lubed up correctly. And this is for the prop game, first of all. Right, right, we, right. No, no, of we, course. Of course. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we have um, water balloons with condoms. Um, the condoms simulate the clitellum and the water balloons simulate the worms. And the clitellum is then spread over each worm. They basically crawl into each other's clitellum like this. Oh, oh. Oh. 69 style. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It's all in their sleeve and everything. All in yeah, that. Yeah, it holds them together. They got to get close enough, you know? They got to ejaculate. We're in the, just the right spot. <laughs> I've never been more excited about worms in my life. I feel like I'm yeah, really, I can relate to worms amazing. right now. And when I find the worms doing it in my bin, I know that I'm doing a good job. So that's how you make the best compost is when you find worms having sex in your compost, 
especially in the springtime, that is a good sign. Good sign. Whew. So get you all a hot bottle for gardening days. Well, so we, yeah. we, we moved from your love and passion and your science aspect of uh, soil and everything related to plants and compost to your story about being identi identified as being a disabled queer artist. I want you to talk about, before we run out of time, about your recent accident in 2018, correct? Yes. So I, real quick, I'm just gonna throw the picture up there. I don't know if they can hear us, but I wanna throw the picture up there because it's very important to show This, that, I showed him the picture, so that is what that's what you look like um, when they found you. I showed a picture of your car. Um, yeah. So I yeah, want I saw you to kind of uh, talk about what that experience was like, what was going through your head. Bring us bring us back to that day, if it's not too um, doesn't cause any yeah. panic. That um, day, um, Max Ryder from the UK um, came to visit me in the Redwood Forest. Came up to the treehouse, spent the night. We had a fabulous night riding the pony um doing little uh, drag dance front uh, videos for our friends on you know messenger and um we had just finished austin international drag festival in austin texas and we had a gig up in seattle so they came to the redwoods picked me up and we were driving to seattle I, it was Thanksgiving weekend. I baked six pies. So I had six pies in the car with us. So we, we got hungry on the way. We could eat. Uh, we basically were just going to drive straight up there. It's a 12 hour drive. Um, and me as a disabled performer, I can't drive long distances. So I was so excited to. I think you're froze. Do it just a second. I have a fan there base there, and I love Seattle. Hugh, Hugh, your, yeah. your video froze. Your video froze from when you were talking about uh, as a disabled uh, individual who can't drive long distance. Can you continue the story from there? Yeah. So Max Ryder was going to take us up to the red to Seattle. So I was so excited to have not only a good drag artist buddy friend that I could travel with and perform with, share backstage, share makeup secrets, show each other, you know, body art. But uh, I was excited to show Max the Redwoods. So that morning we left the house, uh, packed up the car and we stopped in the Redwoods on the way up uh, Prairie Creek and Max hugged his first old growth redwood in life. And so that was amazing. We saw elk, it was beautiful, it was a beautiful day. Um, and then we got back in the car, started heading back north. We needed to make time on the road. And that's the last thing I remember. I don't remember the accident at all. I was a passenger. Uh, so I, I think I was asleep. You know, I think I was maybe past, I don't know, I sleep on long distances, car rides. I some I'm the car, you know, sleeping. So um, I woke up in the hospital. But actually in those photos, though, I've, Max remembers, he's told me stories. I've heard stories from the first responders. And I was the last one in the car. Uh, I was in there for probably three hours. Um person who hit us passed away. They weren't wearing a seatbelt. They were a reckless driver. Two people called the sheriff 16 miles before they hit us, reporting them as a reckless driver. And then, uh, so they, they carted them off. Uh, they were dead. And Max was, Max was definitely alert and screaming and trying to tell them to get me out of the car. I had Crohn's. And so I'm really glad I don't remember that um that time because i was crushed uh literally took them t a lot of time to extract me from that car so you can actually see my forehead 
in that photo. Um, I'm in the car and um, they said they were talking to me though and trying to keep me awake. Um, the first responder cut the seatbelt because it was choking me out, put out a little fire, saved our lives. Um, and then then they they had to use the what's it, air air press hydraulic air press to get you know get the car apart but it was a head-on collision the driver was going over 90 and hit us head-on they came into our lane to pass another vehicle on a two-lane highway on a blind turn came right into our lane We'll, we'll wait for your your um over in a flash yeah um so it sounds it sounds like they gosh they, you know it's like I, I i don't know what i would have done if i was awake you know uh so yeah but it sounds it was, like um it sounds like you you have been through a lot in your life just in this these these couple of different stories that you shared what um what was recovery like from that accident? Well, it's still going. I'm still working on um, recovering. I was in the hospital for five months. I had 15 surgeries. I've got 12 plates in my body. Um, so what broke was my jaw broke in two places up here and right here. So I got two plates on my jaw. Both collarbones broke. So I got a plate on each collarbone. I had a trachea for a while. Um, my left arm was crushed. So I got two plates in this arm, my left elbow. It's, it's amazing my elbow's kind of working again, but I had a metal elbow um, and you could feel all the screws. That was taken out just a few months ago, thank goodness. Um, my pelvis broke in six places. And I've got two plates on the left side and two bolts bolting my sacrum back together and to the right side of my pelvis. Um, both of my femurs were crushed and plated my right shin and my right foot had three fractures. Um, and all of my fractures, because I had Crohn's disease, for so long, I've been on so much prednisone to treat the Crohn's disease, it gave me osteopenia, which is right before osteoporosis, low bone density. So all of the breaks from head to toe, literally head to toe, I was crushed. The breaks are called commutated fractures. And what that means is, you know, the bone doesn't just break in one spot, it just breaks into pieces like, like like a like a, like a spider vein or like if someone hits your windshield and it cracks a little bit kind yeah, of it's like, like shards it looked mm -hmm. like glass and sand and i remember in the hospital looking at the picture of my elbow and thinking it was a silhouette of oatmeal <laughs> like scattered on a table <laughs> it's it's like and my my femurs looked like a pile of rocks and sand and then one looked like broken grass gl glass and feathers I don't know it was just everywhere there was pieces of bone everywhere my jaw little pieces were had to come out um, my collarbones are all in pieces my left arm was crushed yeah pelvis just everywhere so where are you uh, at on your recovery are you able to walk are you in pain? I just, yeah, I just had my right leg re redone. Um, I had the plate taken out. I had it re broken to because it was misaligned, and I had bone grafts put in from my right hip, and they put in a titanium rod up the femur. So my right leg, I can put weight on it now. It was broken for a whole year. It was just completely fractured, didn't heal. It was so bad. So now my left leg needs surgery. And my left leg has been recovering better than my right leg this whole time. But now my right leg is starting to catch up to it. 
and my left leg's really starting to show that it needs work. So, um, so yeah, I, they didn't think I was going to walk though, to be honest. Um, but I knew that if I could get in a pool, I would walk again. And so as soon as I got out of the hospital last April, I was in the hospital till April, um, I got into a pool and I got a pool membership at a gym and I was going almost every day. I was just getting in that pool and I was walking in the pool, in the deep end. It took me a long time. I couldn't walk in the shallow end until after this last surgery, but I kept just trying to walk in the water and get my muscles to work with my brain again. You know, my muscles were so atrophied and gone that they weren't even getting messages from my brain or like twitching. And so it, it took a lot of just my brain to like figure out how to move again. And the water is such a miracle. Water is life. So I'm so thankful. Uh, I missed the water right now. It, it The water got me where I am now, but the gyms are closed. So I'm, ugh, I'm having, having major water withdrawals. And uh, I oh, really uh, could, that beach water is starting to look really good, but it looks scary. I'm scared of the beach still. Uh, but I, uh, I miss the water. That's the hardest thing for me right now. I definitely feel it. I'm hurting, but I am walking on the sand in the beach. And so that is helping me recover and figure out how to walk again. My walking's actually doing pretty good. Um, I'm still using a walker and then on the sand, I'm using some ski poles now just for balance. I've never fallen. The water's always given me good balance. So I just go really, really slow and wait if I need to for a wheelchair or whatever, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm walking. Hugh, 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 Hugh. I know we've only had a few minutes with you, but from those few minutes, I, I, I gained so much understanding on your story. I also gained hope and resilience from what you have been through to where you are now. And I always like to leave individuals with a little bit of something that I've learned from you. And I think that's the thing that I learned most from you is to smile through even the darkest and deepest and most hurtful times in our lives. Because everything you said from compost to being an accident to Crohn's to surgeries to having this to, to being told that, you smiled. You smiled through it. You presented a smile in a way that was healing because you knew a truth that others didn't. And I, I admire that and I love that for you. Um, I do want to ask you to um, thank you so much for being here. You are amazing. And I want to I give you the floor. I want you to leave some last words um, for anybody else listening, where they can follow you, what's next for you, um, and just give them something. Give them something that, that's all about you. All right. Thank you so much, Carnita Asada. I enjoyed being on your show. I wish I could see your beautiful face, though. i just looking at myself. But I am so thankful you asked me to do this. And we should talk again sometime when I can see you. And for all those that have stayed, thank you so much for participating and sharing your time with me. And um, yeah, my parting words is to try to find soil, plant seeds. Uh, If you have any questions about compost, get at me. Uh, Hugh Johnson on Facebook, Hugh Johnson King on Instagram. And I have a show coming up. Um, Maxwell, um, our show is called Climax. Let's see if I can find the, uh, one of the, uh, I forgot the date of it. One thing about recovery is I can't always remember everything, but luckily we have these little computers. And also for those, for those that are watching, we did not get to the 10 topic toss up and that's absolutely fine. Um, maybe Hugh can kind of tell us, are you listening to any good song recently that, that makes you get all energized and pumped up for the day? Oh yeah. Okay. So it's May 21st. It's called climax. So digital. 
and um, it's hosted by um, Maxwell, and it'll be on Twitch Maxwell's Silver, Maxwell Silver on Twitch, May 21st. And my song that um, really has been getting me up is um, I Believe in Miracles. Um, by- oh, well, I guess I guess you just laughed. You just laughed. That's okay. I Believe in Miracles is a song, too. And it is a miracle that you're able to get up and walk and be in accidents and go through so many different things, losing parts of your body and getting other parts that weren't um, – part of who you are, but to be able to walk is a huge, huge music miracle. And I hope somebody took a little bit of resiliency from that. Oh, oh, Hugh, you're back. Did you have, wait, did you have, wait, tell, tell us your song really quick. Go ahead. What is yeah. your song? It's I Believe in Miracles by Hot Chocolate. I believe in miracles since you came along. You sexy thing, you sexy thing, you. I well, believe in you, miracles. Hugh, since you're on I, I usually, I, I am. Think, it's a miracle I survived. I, I was just saying that. I was just saying that. And actually, usually I say goodbye, but I want you to say goodbye, and I want you to sing goodbye, just like you just did. All right. Thank you, Carnelia Sada and uh, Paradox Red. Shout out to you and Fierce P- Queen Pin on the scene. This is my Fierce Pins. You can all hit me up and get a pin that'll help with my recovery costs. And keep believing in miracles, you sexy thing. So uh, I want to say goodbye. So I'll sing it. I believe in miracles since you came along. You sexy thing, you sexy thing, you. Now get on along, all yo. And goodbye. You sexy thing. Bye, we love you.